it's a great pleasure for me to be speaking uh, tonight on WACFs, and speaking on WACFs tonight here in the city for a number of reasons. One of them is because I like returning to the city because I spent over 20 years working in the city. So financial innovation was something that I used to do for a living. Now I'm retired. I always had a hobby, which was business history, and I devote myself now full time to looking at financial innovations in previous eras. And one of the biggest innovations that one might come across were WACFs, and that is the topic of tonight. WACFs are quite familiar to everyone. They, are, they provide welfare in the widest sense in Islamic communities. But my talk tonight, so, let's try this, is on, on WACFs, how they started, how they worked in the beginning, and I will then come to a second topic, which is concessionary lending, so that's financial products to, social, to overcome social exclusion today. And then I will see how these two conceptions, one, the WACF, and two, concessionary lending, what they might have to do with each other and how they could be put together. I already mentioned what WACF does and, every, and what I take it everybody here knows. They are charities that provide welfare in Islamic societies. I earlier put, down, uh, put my cards on the table and said WACFs were a tremendous financial innovation. If you use the word innovation, it means it didn't exist previously and perhaps you already thought, well, you got it wrong just right there because welfare existed before Islam, didn't it? Indeed it did, it goes back all the way to Babylonia. And the earliest um, deed, legal deed of an endowment to enable a temple to go about its business goes back to about the year 1300 before Christ. And there were probably deeds before then. So philanthropy and the provision of welfare is not something that's new in Islam. How did provision of welfare work in Islam? Let's look at that, where, did they, where does the idea come from? Well, the important book, the operative text, is the Koran. Well, what does the Koran say about providing welfare? Quite a lot. There are dozens of mentions of welfare, but when it mentions welfare, what does the Koran use? It uses the term zakat, or sadaka. And the Koran goes on to tell how you're supposed to raise money for zakat and zadaka. The Koran also goes on to say what the purposes of zadaka should be. So there's quite a longish list of things that zadaka will do. But the Quran doesn't mention waqfs. So where do waqfs come from? Now, this is where the plot begins to thicken, because many, some scholars have then said, well, hang on, we can see Zadaka does provide charity, we see waqfs <coughs> provide charity, but one's mentioned in the Quran, the other is not. So what's so originally Islamic about this? <coughs> and then they go on to say, well, the first term in a legal document is 818. The first documentation on buildings is even later. So there are very important scholars, and I'm quoting one there, who says, well, what's, yeah, of course it's Islamic by now. Lots of time as water has gone under the bridge, but they weren't there in the beginning. This is where I think the view is wrong, because what's do go back right to the very beginning of Islam. They go back to the lifetime of Muhammad. And there are a couple of stories that lead up to how the first waqfs were created, but they crystallize at a particular moment in time, and that is after the conquest of Khaybar. Just to recap, Muhammad was born in Mecca, left Mecca, set up his own community in Medina, and from Medina he established his ummah. He was in Medina and things were expanding and in 628, that's the opera, that is a turning point in his career in Medina. Because there, then he launched an expeditionary task force which occupied Khaybar and a couple of areas around that, but that's not material. But in 628, he established cont Muslim control over Khaybar and there were lots of lands. Now, why is this really, really important? The reason this was a watershed in, in Muhammad's career is because previously, whenever he conquered something or raided, the booty was in mobile property, stuff that you could take along with you. And it, these were movable assets, and they were windfalls. The occupation of Khaybar changed everything at a stroke, because now the community was in control of land, 
and land you cannot take away. Land re yields an agricultural harvest year after year after year. So what would an accountant say? Well, he'd say this is recurring income. This is capital. You've now taken control of a capital asset. And controlling a capital asset implies a different approach to co taking control of a movable asset that you can sell. So Mohammed, as was his wont after a conquest or after a battle, and I've got the, uh, one of the early historians here, he would distribute bonuses So he had a, uh, to people who were close to him. And one of his key companions was Umar, very critical individual in the creation of Islamic economics. Umar, and, and I've got the quote here, and maybe you've just scanned it already. Umar said, well, thanks for all this land. What do you think I ought to do with it? And <laughs> Mohammed said, well, I've got an idea. What you should do with it is use it for Sadaka. So there you have it in Ibn Sa'd that four years before Muhammad died, the first waqf was established for the use of Sadaka. So why does that matter? Well, it matters because of the dispute that we heard of earlier that waqf is something that was an add-on bolted on to Islam much later. It, it wasn't. Now, Muhammad was not the only creative economist and not the only innovator at that period. The people who surrounded him also were active in taking his ideas forward. So I've already mentioned um, Umar, who vested the first waqf, and he appointed a manager for it. That was his daughter, Hafsa, who was also Muhammad's wife. So here you have Umar, who's got one idea. And then there's another. There's Abu Bakr, the, the first caliph. And Abu Bakr, when he reached the stage in life that he was settling his affairs and settling his estate, he also said, well, we've got this instrument, the waqf. I'm going to use that. And I'm going to designate the beneficiaries of the waqf, my wider family. So he did what in E and Y would be referred to invent a family trust. It was a family, his waqf was a family trust fund. And really, these two innovations have lasted for centuries. You have the two kinds, I forget the technical terms, but you have the waqfs, which are for provision of public welfare, and you have the waqfs, which, which are family trusts. And these two were invented within a very short span of time. It's really remarkable when you think of it. You live in an area where financial innovations happens all the time. This was invented between 628 and, 630, uh, and 634. So 628 is the conquest of Kaiba, and 634 is the year that Abu Bakr dies. And there you have it. Uh, you have the whole the, the concept of waqf put in place and put into practice. Now, earlier on, I said philanthropy existed before Islam. That's clear. Nobody would dispute that. But why were waqf so immensely different from my point of view? Well, they were different for the following reason, and that has to do it's partly a legal issue. It's partly an accounting issue. They were different because if you were, just to pick one example, but it would apply to everybody pre-Islam, if you were somebody who wished to do something for philanthropy and you wished to make, give an endowment, what would you do? Well, you, would, you might go, as did whoever gave that first endowment in, 13, in 1300 BC, where we have the legal deed. You'd go to the local temple and tell the uh, local super, the priest in the temple, I'd like to do a good thing. You know, I've got lots of money, more than I need. I'll give you this money, and let's make sure this temple goes on working. So what you've got is a bilateral relationship. You are the donor, the benefactor. You give it to the beneficiary. The beneficiary then starts using it. And that was the, that was the way donations worked, as they do in pretty much anywhere where you make a donation. So those donations were taken control of by the beneficiaries. But the waqf was different. And this is the first time where you have not a bilateral agreement, a benefactor giving something to the beneficiary, and the beneficiary does good things. Here you have a benefactor, a beneficiary, and in between you have a manager who makes sure that things are managed the way the benefactor said. And that makes, that changes everything. Because now it's no longer bilateral, it's trilateral. And anybody who runs institutions knows that everybody who is in an institution does their job from their point of view and 
that changes the interaction between the parties concerned. And that's why a waqf is fundamentally different from a donation as practiced before. I can imagine that maybe some of you will say, well, hang on. I see that you're making the point that waqfs are unique, but are they really? Because we know trusts, and trusts work pretty much like waqfs, so they're not unique, really. Well, I appreciate that um, waqfs have parallels with trusts, but that is the case for a particular reason. Because as I aver, trusts actually come from waqfs. There were many waqfs which operated in places like Jerusalem. There were many Europeans who came to Jerusalem. It's easy to see how somebody who has his eyes open, who sees how these waqfs work in Jerusalem, then would go back and say, um, there's a new way of managing foundations, and you would come up with trusts. But the parallels between waqfs and trusts are very clear, and in the essentials, they outweigh uh, all, other, all, all other particulars. In a waqf and in a trust, unlike in any donation that you or I or anybody else makes for a good cause, there are the three parties, and there's a legal agreement that binds what they do. Why does it matter so much to have this particular manager? Well, to begin with, you have the manager, and he's appointed with a legal document. Once he's got a legal document, his hands are tied in many respects. He's authorized to do certain things, but if he's not authorized to do something, he is emphatically not authorized to do something, which means he has to run the ship, he has to steer that ship on a particular course set out at the very beginning. For that to happen, the donor, the manager, and the beneficiary, well, probably not the beneficiary, but the donor, has to go to a lawyer and say, this is what I have in mind, this is how I think it should work. The lawyer is then going to ask critical questions. He says, well, are you sure? What do you mean by this? Um, and what do you think should happen if? Um, and what provision have you made for the following uh, situations which might happen? Now, at the end of it, when they've agreed, the lawyer and the, and the donor have agreed, they draw up a binding agreement. Now, that agreement is binding on everybody. It's binding on the lawyer. It tells him what he can do. It's binding on the use of the assets, because the lawyer can say, well, initially, this waqf was meant to fund purposes A, B, and C, but you know things have moved on. And I think D, E, and F are also very nice things to do, so let's just do those. He can't do that, because he's got an agreement. But what's very important, it's also binding on the donor. Because once he puts those assets into the waqf, the very next day he might come along to the lawyer and say, ah, I've thought about this, you know, uh, I've slept on it. I, I think I'd like to change something. Then it's too late. Because the lawyer will say, well, sorry, you've signed an agreement. And I've got to stick to my agreement. I have to defend the statutes of the waqf against everybody. And you are one of everybody. So you can't tell me afterwards that you'd like to change this. And that makes a big difference to whatever kind of foundations and whatever kind of philanthropy was applied before. So I just want to make sure I have my overview. So, and I, I know I've been banging on about this, um, but th the reason this, this innovation is so important is because the implementation or the, the introduction of WACFs had a tremendous, had many, many ramifications for civil society in the Middle Ages. Let's just compare the situation of somebody who's in Babylonia and somebody in Babylonia in, uh, and somebody who's in Baghdad. He's in Babylonia. He's got more money than he needs. He want, he's got a good heart. He wants to do something. What does he do with it? He gives it to the local temple. So he gives it to a, to a charitable purpose that exists already. He can say, by the way, you know, it would be nice if you looked after something like this or like that. But he can only give it to an institution that's there already. But with a waqf, there's a big difference. Because the waqf is something new. It's something that didn't exist before. So therefore, there's nothing to stop you, if you're living in Baghdad, to say, well, I'd like to set up a waqf. And what I think this waqf should do, and then fill in the dots, it could be running a mosque, it could be uh, 
educating kids, it could be feeding people who travel, it could be running a hospital, it could be building a library, or whatever. So the range of creativity that's enabled by a waqf is much greater than that by a foundation, because the donor can decide for himself what the purpose should be. So for civil society, this was tremendously important. You have civil creativity which can find expression in legally protected assets which fund new innovative activities. There's a complementary, there's a corollary to this. The more philanthropy is managed by the private sector, the less is the requirement for the public sector to be involved. So state-sponsored philanthropy is with every, with every um, new waqf, there's less need for the state to be involved in provision of welfare. It's very interesting that there isn't the time for this, but you can see how waqfs became one of the engines of urban growth in Muslim cities. Um, I've, I've just very recently looked at a very wonderful set of maps of Aleppo in the Middle Ages. And you see how Aleppo grew. So on the outskirts of Aleppo, there would be a new mosque. So somebody says, we're going to put a, let's put a new mosque here. And the waqf is going to, it needs income. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a ring of shops just around this mosque. And, and you can see it growing. So what you had was a neighborhood which was built where, every, where the whole commercial, the commerce of that neighborhood funded the mosque that was the anchor of the neighborhood. And this is how Aleppo grew. So you can see it's an entirely different approach to urban planning than, for example, you would have had in the Roman Empire, where, where you, you probably heard this in school, where, where military considerations determined how a city was laid out. So the waqfs were very important for shaping the very physical aspect of a city, but also civil society in the Middle Ages. Now, waqfs were a very important means for transferring wealth and protecting wealth. And you will find this in many books. I've never seen a systematic overview. But by the time the Ottoman Empire um, ceased to exist, about two-thirds of arable land was in the hand of waqfs. In the 19th and 20th century, with colon colonies established in northern Africa, in India, and with the nation state coming into being, waqf properties were nationalized. This is a very general statement, but it's not important in these contexts. So, but the concept of waqfs still lives on. And now it's moved on to mean a whole host of things to adjust to the present era. So, before we move on from past to present, firstly, waqfs are originally Islamic. Go back to Muhammad's time. They were outside state control. They were commercial entities. They derived commercial income from things such as farms or shops. And the purpose to which this was put was very much the way corporate taxes are used today from, co from businesses. They are used for providing public welfare. Now, things have changed. After most WACs were nationalized, things have changed completely. And WACs have become a very, are used in a very general sense for provision of welfare by the private sector, but also by the public sector. I don't think we need to spend much time on this, especially if everybody works in, in banking. You have income, you have, you have incoming revenue that comes from land, property, shareholding, and you have the, the, uh, the outgoings, which are the purpose of the WACF itself, but also management and admin expenses. So that's the manager of the WACF who also needs to um, pay his, his bills. Now, we're coming to the next section. We've done. We've looked at waqfs, how they started, how they developed in the Middle Ages. We've seen waqfs now disappear and dissolve in, amongst the state um, uh, being in nationalized assets. So let's now move on to where we are now and look at two areas where waqfs can be applied today. One is in microfinance and one is in insurance. Microfinance is a term, everybody's familiar with it, and people are generally aware of the social issue involved, which has to do with social exclusion, a big issue in societies around the world. 
Social exclusion has many reasons, but one of them is lack of finance for people who are on the fringes of society. The reason people on the fringes of society have difficulty tapping funds are several. One is they don't need that much money individually. So if you are in a financial institution to build up a loan book, there are that many more units that you have to work your way through to build uh, a loan book. Much easier to lend to a big borrower. So you have high unit costs. The second is people who are poor have, are less likely to, are more likely to be delinquent than people who are not poor, so therefore you have higher default rates. So you've got a lot of work to do, and then secondly, a lot more loans are not repaid than would be the case otherwise. And if you're looking for a credit rating of socially excluded or poor people, you're going to have a problem because the credit rating agency will also say, well, I've got a lot more work to do here. So this adds further to the costs. So how can Wax, what can WACs do about this mass market? Now, we spoke about financial innovation. I mentioned earlier that innovation already happened a long time ago. And the first concessionary lending institutions in Europe go back a very long way. Lending to the socially excluded sectors of society goes back to the Middle Ages, and one of the first ones was right here in London. In 1361, there was a bishop who, started, who set up a bank to lend at zero interest. But the biggest sector in medieval Europe for concessionary lending was in Italy. And I'm not going to sidetrack here, we'll move on, but the movements were called Monte de Pietà, and they were closely involved and backed by the, uh, by the Vatican. You, if you're interested, uh, you will find when you read about Monte di Pietà, you just have to cross out the word Monte di Pietà and write Wakf instead, and the, it's very, very similar. But very little work is done about these. A good place to start is the, the Wikipedia page, if, if you're interested, and, and take it from there. But the case for concessionary banking, nowadays we like to think we are the first people who, who have an idea, is one that's been current and has been uh, worked up in many, many institutions. And I've got a couple of examples here. Typically, supranational banks, such as the World Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, and so on, they will be involved in it. But it's not only lending to the uh, uh, socially excluded, there's for everybody else who's got the same problem of high unit cost and high default rate. So here in the United Kingdom, it's student loans or government startups. So concessionary lending is not intrinsically something where you would say, well, this is really an issue for a WACF, isn't it? It is, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. Because you don't need to have a WACF to get the idea that you need to find some kind of tool for concessionary lending. Here's an example of how one supranational bank, the Islamic Development Bank, engages in activity to reach out for promoting the social, for, for reducing social exclusion, for example, by way of endowing scholarships or through special assistance programs for disaster and relief area. Um, you'll find analogous initiatives in supranational institutions which are non-Islamic. But I've, as I've already made that point, there is an overlap here between the conception and the use of concessionary lending and the rationale for it and the rationale of WACFs. So we've said how you can get involved, why you get involved in concessionary lending. We've also spoken about WACFs. How do you link the two? Well, what you could have is the relationship between a bank lending to a borrower. The bank gets involved in lending to the borrower, incurs costs which are higher than in, any, in most other sections of its loan book. Well, and then you can have a WAC providing either a guarantee against default, in the case of default, either partial or full, or the WAC could then subsidize the loan, bringing the interest rate down from the one that reflects the risk in a commercial sense to one that, is, uh, that could be borne and is tolerable by whoever happens to be the borrower. So this is the way the WACF could work. So, but let me be clear, the WACF has commercial in has income. That income is accrues from commercial activities, but the purpose of the WACF is charitable. So this is not a commercial income for the WACF, 
This is the purpose of the Waqf, which is for reducing the financial stress on certain borrowers. That's how a Waqf could be put to use in concessionary lending. I now come to insurance, Islamic insurance called takaful. Now, insurance, we're now switching from microfinance. We're switching from microfinance to insurance. Insurance is a very complicated business. It's a business where you raise funds, well, where you, uh, where you have people who have insurable events. They come to the insurance company and say, please make sure that if this insurable event happens, I receive compensation from you. The insurance company receives premia from those people who sign up with them and invests those premia and then has a new income source because those investments yield a return. And once the insurable event, the accident happens, well then it's built up the reserves to pay for that damage. So that's one income source that the insurance company has. It's got another one, that's equity. So in, a, in an insurance company that's listed, that's a PLC, Shareholders put up the initial equity, and that is also invested and is also used to defray the costs of insurable events. Now, how does that work in Islamic insurance called takaful? The takaful is very similar to, uh, to an insurance company which is not a PLC but is a mutual company. Some, uh, some non-Islamic insurance companies work very much like a takaful in as much as you have the insured who are part, who, have a, who are stakeholders in the insurance company, such that somebody who is insured pays the premium over to the company, the company invests just as a conventional insurance company does, and that return is used to increase the reserves and build reserves and provisions for the time when the insurable event happens and the insurance company has money going out. So the takaful works very much like an insurance company where you have, uh, which works very much like an insurance company, a conventional insurance company which is on a, uh, organized as a mutual company. So that's another way to how a waqf can be involved, but please note that this is taking the waqf concept into a new arena because the classical waqf was one where you had income coming in on a commercial basis and a strictly defined charitable purpose. Here you've expanded the conception of the waqf. The conception of the waqf as one which provides charity, provides public welfare, and you're saying this is a mutual company which in itself provides welfare because it shares, it shares out risks involved. This brings me to, but to my last aside, because the notion of risk is one which I find very, very interesting and which I believe uh, warrants a lot more work. I understand, I don't speak Arabic, but I know from people who do that the word risk, spelt R-I-Z-Q, appears in the Quran in many, many, many places. Now, we tend to think that the word risk comes from the Italian, or from even Latin, risicum. It doesn't. It's not a European word, really. So it's just a hunch I have that our European term risk may actually come from the Arabic term risk. And if I knew Arabic, and if I were a Quran scholar, that's the paper I would want to write. I would like to examine what the term risk in the Quran means, what the contexts are, because risk management is just so important and so interesting. And considering we don't know where the word comes from, if that's where it comes from, that's worth writing up. So, but of course, other people, there are plenty of smart people, so sooner or later somebody who speaks Arabic, no doubt, will pick that up and say whether or not there's that, there, that idea has any legs. So I'd just like to summarize, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a rapid tour, uh, a whirlwind tour through a long period. We started in Babylonia, 1300 BC. We're now in a little bit later. And we had stuff going on in between. But the key date in between was in 628, when in Khaybar, Muhammad and his companions devised a new means of philanthropy, which was the waqf. And 
Mohammed and Umar and Abu Bakr in the space of a handful of years founded or established precedents for the two key forms of waqf, one for providing public welfare, the other for providing uh, for estate management for family trusts. And this was a radical um, legal innovation. Waqfs anticipate trusts by several centuries. Though it's never been proven, there is circumstantial evidence that trusts actually derive from the practice of waqfs import a knowledge transfer from the Middle East. Wax then went on, and in compliance with Sharia guidelines for investment became very important hubs of, or initial, or instigators of economic growth in medieval cities in the Middle East and in Islamic societies, which were organized differently from the way Europe cities were in Europe. They were nationalized largely in the 19th, 20th century. They now have taken on new kinds of connotations, and there are two specific areas where they have been put to use. One is in microfinance, involved in the issues of social, overcoming issues of social exclusion, and the other in the area of Islamic insurance. That brings me really to the end, bar one single slide, which I wanted to show you just in case anybody's interested in following up. There's an enormous interest, uh, in, an enormous, there's a burgeoning literature on waqfs. Most of it is, a large part of it is situational, describing waqfs in certain places, in certain, uh, usually in certain contexts. Uh, but there's a big uh, literature about the origin of, of waqfs and how they developed. And this is a selection of some of the really good books that, um, and articles that I have come to use and found invaluable. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Thank you.